see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rutsch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy. And I'm here today with Carolyn Pedwell, and Carolyn is a lecturer in the Media and Cultural Studies School of Arts and Cultures at Newcastle University in, in the UK. So thank you very much for joining me for this dialogue. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, this is great. Um, I came across uh, kind of your work, uh, there was an interview that uh, was done um, with you, and you had, uh, I think you were speaking to a book that you're uh, working on. It's, uh, it's a forthcoming book called Effective Relations, the Transnational Politics of Empathy. So I wanted to just kind of talk with you about your work and kind of your views of empathy and and just any kind of thoughts you have and just kind of hear your point of view on, on this. Uh, would you like to perhaps uh, uh, kind of talk about, oh, maybe just introduce yourself a bit more. Is there something else you'd like to say about yourself? Um, yeah, well, you, you've said I'm a, I'm a lecturer at Newcastle. So my job is to, to teach media and cultural studies and media and cultural theory. And I have a background in gender studies as well. I did my PhD in gender studies. So those areas, kind of come together um, to, to create my interest in empathy and, and kind of the politics of emotions more generally. Um, and by that I mean I'm interested in how emotions might be related to power in particular ways. Um, so thinking about politics as having to do with relations of power and how do we think about emotions as, as not just being psychological or biological, um, but political in a particular sense. Um, and, and the book that you mentioned is, is about that. Um, it's thinking about the politics of empathy, particularly in a transnational setting. So I guess the key question for me is, what does it mean to think about how we might feel, mobilize, talk about, cultivate empathy transnationally? Okay, so it, it's really about empathy and kind of the relationship uh, to power, like how does empathy and power relate? And when you're saying transnationally, you're meaning kind of at a international, global, uh, maybe between states or, or corporations or something like that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it could be, could be all of those things. The way I'm thinking about transnational is that it both recognizes the continuing power of, of kind of nations, states, and, and those types of borders and boundaries to orchestrate how we live. But at the same time, it also looks how those boundaries are constructed um, and how they're often shifting and changing. Um, so transnationally, I guess for me, is a framework to think about how emotions can't be thought about within the boundaries of any given nation, state, or space, but are, you know, circulating across those boundaries all the time in different ways. And, you know, how could we make sense of, of that? Well, how did you uh, get interested in this topic of, of empathy? How did that kind of start? Um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I have to think quite carefully um, how I got here. One, one way that I became interested in empathy is through my um, academic um, training in gender studies. I did a master's and a PhD at gender studies um, at the LSE in London. And I started reading a lot of feminist and gender studies literature about how we do research and how we kind of arrive at knowledge and decide what's legitimate and what's true and false. And a lot of the feminist literature of the 1970s and 80s and onwards was trying to critique a kind of positivist model of doing research. The idea that, you know, we can only research and, and know the truth about that which we can see and measure and we should do this in a totally detached and objective um, way that we should aim for neutrality in research and so forth. And, and feminist critiques, along with, you know, other kinds of, of, of cultural and social science critiques, were, were really concerned with what was left out of that kind of very cold, detached, positivist model. And one of the ways that they critiqued that and, and tried to think about it differently was through empathy, through thinking about, you know, how do we actually know things, gain knowledge, find out about things in the world 
through emotional ways of knowing, um, through emotional connections that, that might be empathetic or, or might involve other kinds of emotion. How can emotion and affect be ways of knowing, of sharing knowledge, of determining what's true or false in a way that actually turns that kind of detached, you know, positivist view of objectivity on its head in a way. So for me, that was kind of um, a really important um, point for thinking about the relationship between emotion, um, knowledge, and power. Mm. So it, it's uh, within academia, then, there's, there's been this kind of this notion where you have to be detached and you have to be kind of the cold observer. And then there's been a trend, well, you have to actually kind of get involved, you know, with the empathy. You got to kind of feel what's going on. And uh, I guess it sounds like just through your studies, you kind of made that transition and kind of for kind of like just kind of wanting to look more at that uh, empathic process and how it works and kind of the effects of it and the functionality of it and um, and how it, uh, I guess, uh, changes or 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 um, promotes the existing power structures, something like that? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think, um, I mean, one of the biggest critiques of that kind of classical positivist, um, you know, traditional idea of objectivity, that, that kind of whole framework for research and knowledge in academia, was that it actually reinforced, you know, existing dominant power structures. It reinforced kind of an idea where you have um, well, usually often kind of um, senior middle class white males in, in charge of what counts as knowledge and what doesn't and kind of so um, more subjective or emotional ways of knowing were in part a way to think about how can we listen to people's experiences, voices, ways of knowing that have been placed at the margins, you know, that have marginalized from kind of dominant ways of of knowing and creating knowledge and validating knowledge. What happens when we move outside the center and try to think about other ways of knowing, other ways of validating truth that don't depend on that, that kind of objectivity. Um, so very much thinking about empathy and emotion in, in that particular way as being part of an attempt to disrupt kind of dominant power structures in academia and kind of more broadly. So what is, what is your interest then? Is it, are you wanting to kind of uh, change the power structures uh, to kind of make it so that everybody is kind of heard and seen or kind of, where is it, where's your kind of your work going? And um, I mean, I, I think generally um, that is kind of one of the, the goals you could say of kind of feminist, uh, post-colonial, anti-racist um, academic knowledge projects in general. In this particular book that I'm talking about, I'm kind of coming in at a slightly different angle because I'm observing now that empathy as a, as a word, as a concept, as a discourse seems to be everywhere. It's not just in the feminist literatures, but it's, it's all over the place, as of course you know. Um, and a lot of the places I'm seeing empathy are not ones that are necessarily concerned with social justice, or breaking down dominant power structures, or making marginalized voices be heard. In some cases, they're actually um, multinational corporations who might be said to be doing precisely the opposite of that. They are um, conservative politicians who use a discourse of empathy and compassion as a, a kind of rhetorical tool um, that has particular um, effective um, value for the types of political messages that they want to get across. So I'm interested in mapping, in a sense, all of the different ways that empathy is kind of being talked about, mm. mobilized, um, you know, used in social, cultural, and political discourses and thinking about their implications. And so I guess you could say that I'm interested not only in the you know, transformative or democratic possibilities of empathy, but also in its risks, its contradictions, um, its possibility to be abused in particular ways. Mm. So it's, uh, I mean, empathy can be, I, I use the term culture of empathy, and by that I mean a, a, a widespread empathy where kind of everybody's empathizing with everyone else, and it's a continuous, 
growing of empathy, but empathy can also be used for kind of in-group, right? It's like, uh, mm -hmm. it's my, it's like the, the, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the image of the concentration camp, right? The, the, the Nazi, you know, the, the prison guards are doing horrible, brutal, uh, you know, stuff to the inmates. And then they go home to their loving wives and pet their dogs and play with their kids and have a very, and they have their friends. There was some photographs of, you know, I remember recently it was photographs of uh, concentration guards in, out in the country having a picnic and they're all, they're playing music and singing and all this kind of stuff. So we have, um, you know, it can be a very empathic, uh, you know, in group. And then there's the out group. Is that kind of what you're kind of some of the problems you're seeing or? Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's that's a really um, important kind of example because it, it, it points to the question of, well, what kind of empathy with and for who? Who does that kind of empathy serve? What are its implications? Who does it include and exclude? And I think there's lots of situations where we want to be asking those questions rather than necessarily assuming that empathy, wherever it happens and however, is a good thing for everybody. Um, it, related to the example you just gave, it's interesting, it also raises questions about well, what exactly do we think empathy is? How is empathy differently defined? The philosopher Mar Martha Nussbaum has a really pertinent example um, in one of her books where she says, well, by some definitions we could consider the torturer having to be extraordinarily empathetic because he needs to put himself in the shoes of the other, that is the person that he wants to torture, to see and feel exactly how they're feeling and know what will affect them the most, what will be the most humiliating or painful or, you know, cause the most suffering. Now, by other definitions, that wouldn't be empathetic at all because it clearly doesn't involve care or concern for that other. But if we understand empathy to be about imaginative perspective taking, to be putting oneself in the shoes of the other, then in some ways that could fit the definition. The torturer could be empathetic. So I think it's thinking about, you know, yeah, what, what do we mean? What do different people mean when they're using this term? And is it always a good thing? Yeah. That's so it's really, answer. you're really addressing like what's the definition of empathy and how are people using the word? And, and um, you know, I've, I've interviewed uh, Dan Batson, who's been studying empathy for like 20, 30 years. And uh, he has like eight ways that the word is used in academia, right? And they're kind of talking about different kind of phenomenon and you know and you know they're all coming at it from different angles and so, some of the definitions overlap with compassion other ones overlap with sympathy and i also interviewed um paul ekman and he he was interested in compassion so and he said well to get the compassion i had to study uh, empathy and it was a total morass so in terms of you know the definition so it's a real problem in terms of you know what are we meaning by the word uh, empathy so it sounds like that's what you're kind of stepping into yeah i mean in in a way though i mean it's both a problem and and kind of what's interesting in and of itself is, is kind of thinking about all of these different definitions and their different implications. So I wouldn't want to try to intervene in that by saying, okay, you know, we got to start at this mess by agreeing on one single definition and saying that's it. I mean, I don't, I think that's actually the problem when people try to say, you know, this is what empathy is, this is its criteria, and we all need to speak in the same way because I guess that's a very unempathetic way yeah. <laughs> to, to think of empathy. If you try to pin it down, then you're clearly not seeing um, you know, or you're clearly not being receptive to other ways of knowing and thinking and feeling. So rather than trying to offer a kind of universalist or, or single definition myself, I'm more interested in well, what are all the different ways it gets talked about and in what context and which one of those kind of are most suggestive or, or thoughtful or interesting and maybe how can we put different understandings together in different ways. Um, yeah. Well, um, well, the way Dan approaches it, he says, um, uh, it's just that when you go into the dialogue, just 
you have to con use your definition consistently and then articulate what definition you're using. So he's kind of saying it kind of like you're saying, you know, in the sense that you can't like force a definition, but it's good to kind of lay out your definition, you know, before you, as you start the conversation to know, like, what are we, what are you talking about? You know, so, and so maybe we can ask, what is your definition? So if you well, can kind I, of say, or what, <laughs> I probably have several definitions that would be useful in different contexts or different times. So, I mean, I'm almost kind of opposed to definition for the way that it fixes, um, you know, a concept and therefore limits it. But I, I mean, of course, I have done a lot of thinking about this. And if I if I did have to kind of say one thing, I think for me, empathy is most interesting and, and possibly productive if we think about it not as putting oneself in the other's shoes or not as trying to be able to get some exact or, or accurate sense of exactly what another might be feeling, thinking, um, or so forth, but rather thinking about empathy as a critical receptivity or openness to being affected by ways of seeing, being, and feeling that don't simply confirm what one thinks one already knows. So kind of being emotionally affected by something that just doesn't repeat everything you think you already know about the other or the world or, or so forth. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of being open to new experiences in a sense, um, to uh, feeling uh, kind of a variety of, of new affective emotional experiences. I, you know, one way I kind of like to approach this is through metaphor, because sometimes it kind of is, can be revealing. And, you know, empathy is often described is that actually the metaphor of standing in someone else's shoes and looking through someone else's eyes, which is a little bit of a cognitive Im imaginative approach. Um, for me, empathy is like a cornucopia in the sense, and it actually kind of addresses, I think, what you're talking about in the sense that it opens the door to feeling this, you know, rich experience of other people. I can feel someone's, you know, sadness, but their joy and their creativity and their, and, you know, their, I do kind of this freestyle dance and it's just like all kinds of motions and you know, there's so many different feelings. You can't even put words, words on them. So it's like being open to all those experiences. Um, so I'm wondering if you have like a metaphor that kind of resonates with you. Uh, I, I mean, I think I have, I have thought about it, and it, it, again, it's a hard question because I don't think that there's any one metaphor that kind of captures the, the multiple and different ways that, that empathy gets talked about. But I do think, I know that a number of people have compared empathy to the act of reading a novel or engaging with kind of a literary work, and I think that that's a really interesting and productive example for a number of reasons. Um, the, the post-colonial um, scholar Gayatri Spivak um, had an article that I was reading recently where she was talking about anthropologists or sociologists who go and do field work, um, you know, an ethnography or participant observation and kind of have direct um, observation of, of the people that they are wanting to um, write about. She says that that can be a very important way of doing research, but we also need ways to remember how to imagine to remember how to be somewhere, to ha inhabit a place that's not the self. And she says that, that reading literature or reading a novel can be a really good way to do that. She says, when we read a novel, we suspend belief and we put ourselves in the position of the protagonist and we you know, allow ourselves to be surprised and even shocked by the twists and turns in the plot. And I think that is actually a really um, interesting way of thinking about the kind of empathy that I, I guess I'm interested in, that kind of critical openness or receptivity to being surprised, to having one's expectations confounded or disrupted, to having the ways in which perhaps one even sees the world or understands what's true and, and false be, be shaken a bit. Um, and also I think literature is important um, to the kind of work I want to do about empathy because it's a form of knowledge and feeling that's really premised on imagination. And I think because literature is not bound to reflect what 
currently exists on the ground, you know, the status quo, although, you know, it certainly might do so, it has the potential to imagine ways of being and feeling and seeing the world that don't simply confirm to what we already know. It kind of has the potential to imagine perhaps radically new ways of interacting with others, social worlds that kind of don't conform to the models that we currently have. And that relates to the kind of empathy that I'm interested in. You know, how might empathy not just be about the imaginative ability to kind of put oneself in the other's shoes, but the imaginative ability to kind of see a whole different landscape or social world or kind of set of relations between people that's, you know, maybe totally different than the one we have now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's really being open to, so empathy is like a, a, a novel in the sense that you're following someone's or or multiple people's kind of narrative of life and their experience and you're kind of just going, following with. Uh, for, that reminds me, some, um, some people, you know, I ask this metaphor question a lot and somebody said empathy is like being a tracker, you know, like the, in the, in the old west, you had the Indian tracker or the, you know, the mountain men, they would do tracking and it's like following along with the trail, you know, with the, the signs and uh, so the novel is a little bit like that, right? We're following along, tracking the uh, internal feelings and, and landscape of maybe the, the author and, and the characters. Yeah, yeah. and I think that the, the, um, the example of, of, of tracking is interesting because in a way, if you're tracking, you're not necessarily in control yourself. You have to kind of let go of, mm. of control in a way you have to follow and allow yourself to be led and to be affected. So that, that is kind of something common to the idea of tracking and, and perhaps reading a novel. Um, I also like the idea of, of reading um, or of thinking about texts and empathy because it raises the question of whether empathy can only relate to relationships between human subjects or could we think about empathy outside the category of the human being or the human subject? So, um, I mean, Spivak, the theorist I mentioned before, raises a question of could you consider empathy between texts? So if, for example, one text has been translated into another language, um, could you think about there being empathy between the two texts? That there's some sort of empathetic relation that the, the, the translated text has been able to convey something, you know, of the original in, in a particularly empathetic way. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I don't know, but I think, I think it's important to think about empathy and other emotions as not necessarily being confined within the boundaries of like a human being or the individual subject that may be circulating more widely than that. Yeah, well, that you had mentioned that about empathy related to uh, other values, and I thought that was uh, before I kind of, I did want to get into that, but I thought maybe I would just lay out kind of the framework that I'm operating from for empathy so that we kind of have, like Dan Batson says, just put out the uh, the definitions that you're using. And for me, empathy is like, a, you know, generally like a four parts to it. Uh, the first part is I call uh, self-empathy, which is like self-awareness, mindfulness, uh, sensory awareness of what's going on kind of in our own bodies. And uh, kind of the deeper we can go into ourselves and the op more open we can be, it creates our receptivity to mirrored empathy, which is kind of through mirror neurons. As you're shaking your head, you know, my, my neurons are mirroring what's kind of going on for you. And as you smile, you know, my, I can feel that through mirror neurons. And the kind of the more open, more self-empathy I have, the more open I am to that mirrored uh, empathy or also called uh, affective empathy, you know, contagion kind of ties in with that and uh, emotional empathy. Then there's kind of the uh, perspective taking, which is, uh, you know, kind of based on, it seems to be based on a sense of self-awareness. As we recognize ourselves as separate beings, we can kind of take someone's kind of position, kind of uh, imagining what it would be like in their situation and you know actors are really good at, at that for example um and then uh the fourth part would be uh, empathic action 
which is that as we kind of connect with someone else and we kind of hold their humanity, you know, let me see if I can get this on the screen, uh, hold the humanity, you know, that person's humanity and our humanity kind of in the same in our hearts, that we kind of take action. It, it's not just uh, like compassion, which is while well, someone is suffering and I take action, it's, it's really, you know, I take action to double your joy, you know, double your creativity, um, and, you know, have for, you know, your, uh, your pain and suffering kind of. So, and that I've seen that really play out in mediation, like when people are in conflict and you kind of do all this mediation with them. And then it's like they, they create a sense of connection and they start seeing the world through each other's eyes and know how the other person feels. And then they put together a plan of how they're going to go forward and work together and, it's almost like a new power relationship gets developed out of that, out of that process. So that's kind of the, the, the definition I'm, I'm kind of using. So I'm kind of curious how that kind of resonates with your understanding. Yeah. I mean, I think that sounds like a really well thought out kind of definition and also kind of thinking as empathy as a process. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that, that element resonates kind of with how I would think about empathy and that it's, it's, it's always in process. So I, I, for me, empathy is not something that kind of has a start point and, an, and a discrete end point and then somehow you've reached total empathy or something, but it's always in process also because I don't think you ever necessarily know if you've fully or if you could even say accurately achieved empathy you know you'll never really know whether you kind of actually got you know a holistic sense of how another person felt in a given circumstances or what they saw or why they you know felt the way they did you you know that will always be somewhat up in the air so it's kind of always in process rather than rather than um, achieved and I think linked to that, I mean, maybe one of the, the questions I would have, especially applying this maybe transnationally, is, is, is thinking like, how often is empathy or indeed any kind of emotional relation or, res or response something that we kind of, um, you know, actively and intentionally plan and then do? You know, are, does that actually the way that empathy necessarily works most of the time? Or, or sometimes does it kind of just happen? And, and might it be fleeting and go away and we might not realize or, or decide that that was empathy until afterwards, you know, retrospectively? I mean, how often is empathy kind of a, a planned, targeted kind of activity? Um, and I guess the other question that relates to that is kind of, in the mediation situation, for example, that you described, um, those are, you know, a situation where you're involving two people or multiple people who are face-to-face -face kind of in, in geographical, you know, proximity. What happens when we think about empathy where proximity of that sort is not possible? So if you're thinking about transnational empathy where there's no kind of face-to-face -face, uh, proximity, and in fact you might be trying to or or want to empathize with a person or a group of people that for whatever reasons you will never be face to face with you will never meet in person you will never be able to think of necessarily as an individual kind of human being in the way that you might in a different kind of circumstance um that kind of confuses things more than than clarifies but i think those are some of the questions that that kind of i'm asking when i'm deciding or when I'm just kind of mapping the different ways that empathy gets gets talked about. Yeah, you're kind of wanting to use the uh, questioning approach to delve into the nature of empathy. Like, here's empathy, and let's start posing some questions about the nature of empathy and um, see what kind of answers kind of come up and how can we kind of delve into the nature of how empathy works mm. is kind of what I'm getting. Yeah, I I'm, I really like um, the idea you have about kind of self empathy. I think, you know, part of what I'm interested in doing is disrupting the idea that that empathy is always about kind of relationship between a self and an other who are both human subjects. And I think one way to think about that it is self empathy, a relationship between a a self and a self. 
um, which kind of gets at the idea that we're not always unified. You know, sometimes we have kind of different selves and, mm -hmm. and, um, and the idea of mindfulness is, is quite interesting there. I mean, how is one's relationship to themselves, when one's kind of presentness to oneself related to their effective interactions or engagements with others? Um, and I think for the kind of empathy that I'm interested in, which, which is around kind of critical openness or attunement or receptivity to kind of other ways of being and knowing and feeling, self-empathy um, might play an important role there. Yeah. It, you know, what's, oh, yeah, it's the self it is to, uh, I think there's like studies about, you know, there's, there's a, a, um, a, a condition where you can't articulate your feelings as I can't remember the name. It's something like Alex, Alex Athea or I don't know, it's something Alex something. And so people who have that difficulty of connecting to their own feelings, it actually becomes an inhibitor to them empathizing with others. So as, as we're trying to read someone else, we have to be able to read um, how how they're, you know, through mirror neurons, how that's kind of playing out within ourselves is how I understand it. So I think that mm -hmm. speaks a little bit to what you're talking about. You're kind of interested in the self-empathy. How does that kind of play into uh, or affect um, the whole empathy uh, process? Mm. I mean, also the, the kind of example you just made kind of raises some other questions for me, mm -hmm. which is, um, you know, if we are kind of um, promoting empathy as something that we want in our society that we think will improve human relations, you know, that we think will lead us towards greater social justice, how do we take into account the fact that some people are more or less capable of empathy for others for a whole bunch of reasons that range from the genetic and the biological to um, the amount of time people have to the amount of economic resources people might have? Um, I mean, you know, is empathy equally possible for everybody? And if not, do we risk excluding people further if we say that, you know, empathy is one of the most important things and everybody's got to do it? Mm -hmm. um, well, it seems like if you tell people they have to be empathic, you're not empathizing with them, right? It's like, you must be empathic. It's kind of like the power over and it's not an empathic, uh, so it's hard to tell people you must be empathic. Even though Barack Obama said his mother would get, well, the only time he, he, she would get mad was when he kind of didn't think about others. And she'd get mad and she'd say, you know, how do you think that person would feel? So, I don't know. Yeah, you know, I, I remember that 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 example from, from one of his memoirs, and he certainly uses empathy in a lot and kind of how he wants to present himself and, and speak politically. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, I'm kind of, if I'm trying to be as honest as possible, I think in my everyday life, uh, you know, at work, um, I do value what, what I consider empathy a lot and kind of people that I, for whatever reasons in my own head, deem to be unempathetic, I find very frustrating sometimes. You know, people that I think can't seem to understand how other people might feel if they say the thing that they, they did or if they don't take into account this. I find that really, really difficult. And so on an everyday level, I'd probably say that, yeah, I do think that empathy is important. Um, but if I'm trying to be more critical in my research and think about, you know, what happens when if empathy is everywhere in politics and business and science and in psychology, to the point where it comes a kind of a requirement, a kind of injunction, a kind of almost solution to, to kind of any number of problems, then how does, how does it, as you say, become almost em unempathetic or unempathic? How does kind of it, it kind of become a, a will to power in a sense that um, seems to be contradictory to 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 each definition yeah or, or kind so of, uh, that empathy becomes it's like you could i mean you can use the word empathy right you could be associated with power somehow so that it becomes unempathic in its own nature somehow right it's like uh, you have to be empathic and then you kind of intimidate people you know i thought i interviewed uh, someone um what's it uh 
Michael Lerner. So he was a, a he's now a rabbi and he was a leader in the Students for Democratic Society in the 60s, which was kind of the more radical, uh, you know, uh, anti-war movement. And he said that at that time, there was a lot of, well, we have to be loving, right? It's like love is the value. And then the movement, people started kind of beating each other up and saying, you're not being loving enough. <laughs> and you're not being loving yeah. enough. No, you're not being loving enough. And and so do we have a, you know, do we create that culture of empathy where everybody's kind of judging each other for being not empathic? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, that's a really, I think, important point and, and kind of question and I guess linked to that one of the things I'm interested in my research and thinking about the transnational politics of empathy is how is empathy being talked about in the context of kind of transnational capitalism and, and neoliberalism and, and, and one of the ways is that empathy has become um, described as a kind of skill or capacity which should be developed by people in the workplace, which should be used by people in business, for example. To um, so, so one of the examples is in in business. You know, popular business literature is, is if you, um, as somebody that works for a company trying to sell a product, are more empathetic, so you can put yourself in the position of the mind of the buyer, then you'll you know create a situation where you can make more profits and and accumulate you know. Uh, more money and stuff, and that's a that's a crude kind of reduction. But when empathy becomes a kind of market commodity, something that we're encouraged to develop to make profit, whether that's through selling a product or through building up our own personal kind of um, set of skills and, and qualities, you know, what what happens to empathy? What happens to kind of emotion when it's something that can be measured, bought, and sold almost in a way? Um, and is that antithetical to kind of the ways that those of us who are interested in, uh, well, social justice, to put it generally, um, in terms of empathy, should be concerned about? Yeah, so you're really exploring, I mean, you know, I'd asked, you had some, you'd sent me some responses to some questions I'd posed, and you had uh, had a list of uh, values that, or emotions that you're it, wondering like how does empathy relate to you know anger how does empathy relate to shame how does it relate to fear and hope and you know we're kind of extending it into justice and into power and and so forth so it's really a you know a great thing to i mean these questions of how what this relate these relationships are and i actually created a web page where i'd like to do panel discussions kind of thematically exploring each value kind of is a separate value. So it's like, what's the relationship of empathy to shame? And for example, Brene Brown, I don't know if you're familiar with her work, she's, you know, explored empathy and shame to an, ex uh, to quite, you know, to an, ex to, a, ex to a quite a bit. And, you know, and really, you know, what's the relationship of empathy to anger? What's em the relationship, empathy to power? And uh, there's also kind of like, uh, can you have like empathy in one hand and then kind of self-interest at the other and kind of be kind of going between the two, right? Was as you're saying, like the marketing is like, well, we're going to have some empathy, but we're going to use empathy for acquiring, manipulating people. And, and so, yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, probably I, I mean, empathy is in the title of my book, and I'm obviously, you know, very interested in it. But I think in the end, I think what might be more productive, at least from my perspective, is not to kind of isolate empathy, you know, as singular or as kind of happening in, in isolation from other emotions um, or, or kind of ways of knowing or, or feeling. And so I'm, I'm interested in affect relations and that might be relations between different kinds of emotions as you say it might be relations between uh, different subjects different objects um, but thinking about a wider range of emotions feelings and affects that might be politically salient and perhaps transformative or productive um, so often we kind of it seems that a lot of the time we rely on a binary or a, or a dichotomy where we have good emotions and bad emotions. And we assume, for example, that empathy, compassion, sympathy, and hope are good emotions. They're the kind of things we want. We should work to cultivate them and, and you know, they will help us achieve 
good things. And, and then we tend to think, you know, well, anger, shame, disgust, um, you know, sadness, melancholia, these are, these are bad things that we want to, to get rid of and, and to limit. And they'll, you know, they'll only kind of keep us held down and not kind of achieving um, the goals we want to. And I, I think actually social justice is not about canceling out or kind of getting rid of these so-called negative emotions, but more about taking them seriously, trying to think about what are the structural relations of power and the context in which anger, shame, fear, you know, disgust are generated and arise, but also, you know, in what context might anger actually be more productive to creating self-transformation that might lead to social justice than empathy might be? Or in particular circumstances, is it actually the interaction between feelings of shame and empathy and anger that could be transformative? I mean, maybe we need to get angry about things. Maybe we need to feel shame, for example, about our own privilege, our own kind of complicity in perpetuating kind of relations of domination as much as we need to feel empathy for others. Um, so I'm interested in the relationships between emotions, both kind of good and bad and, and breaking down kind of distinctions that seem a bit too stark or, or too simple. Well, it seems that one of your uh, interests is really social justice and kind of, it, I, I, I've been one. there's been, yeah, I mean, social justice has a long history, you know, within, at least here, I just in the UK as well. And um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious about how, how empathy relates to social justice, because I've, for myself, you know, I think that uh, I'm interested in a culture of empathy and justice has a focus, it seems like, um, I mean, I'm still trying to understand it, but it's, it, there's a lot of um, a kind of a sense of equal, equalizing. Uh, so, for example, in, in the justice system, the metaphor for justice is the scales, right? It's like that you're blinded and you're equalizing something. So there's been some kind of a harm done between people and then you bring them into the justice system. You've got this battle between, you know, two gladiators who are um, lawyers and they use like all these verbal and other means to kind of battle it out. Somehow some truth kind of emerges out of that battle. And then there's a winner, a victor and, the you know, a person that lost. Whereas a different model is kind of the restorative justice, what I would call restorative empathy, which is the people who have been are in conflict come together and actually, you know, it's a ruptured uh, relationship or perhaps there wasn't even a relationship there to begin with. And it's a process for creating, uh, reestablishing a, a relationship and a connection and then kind of mutually going forward um, to, uh, you know, create kind of a new uh, life. So I kind of see the, the whole social justice movement a bit more of the competitive, um, you know, let's duke it out. We got, I got to get my share of the, of the pie. You know, there's a limited amount uh, of a pie. We have to kind of fight over how much of the, sh the slice we get. Whereas I mm -hmm. think we, you know, my metaphor is more like we got to trans, you know, change the, the, the pie into a cornucopia you know, and that empathy can be that kind of cornucopia. So that's a little bit of how I'm kind of visioning it right now, wondering how that kind of resonates. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's uh, you know, some really interesting questions to ask. I mean, I think the term social justice gets used in a lot of different ways to mean a lot of different things. And, and again, it's something I don't think that there's one useful definition only for um, certainly the kind of idea that you're trying to think about a, a that is like a competitive leveling um, you know is not of course um, the kind of social justice that I'm interested in there's all sorts of debates you know in the histories of, of feminist theory and anti-racist thought and and whatever about you know should you be looking for equity or or equality if equality means treating everybody equally but it doesn't account for the fact that people aren't starting at the same point and there's never been a level playing field maybe we need to think about equity and that might mean treating you know some people you know differently based on a whole bunch of, of circumstances to arrive at, at, at something we might call equality 
equality or social justice. So there's kind of all these these different questions about about what does it mean to achieve or to work towards or to envision social justice. I think these questions are context um, specific and I think they relate to kind of broader questions about how do we understand um, a whole bunch of things like, you know, freedom, um, uh, autonomy, agency, um, progress. Do we think that kind of society just progresses and, and or do we think that something kind of different happens? Um, I mean, these, these are much bigger questions, but I guess for me, social justice would be partially thinking about how do we arrive at or how do we even kind of imagine different models of organizing society that doesn't just reduce us all to having to compete in that kind of thing of trying to get your piece of the pie because that's the only thing you can do is to compete in a kind of this competitive marketplace, um, you know, that's, that's run by the laws of the market and not kind of by other laws. And so one thing that social justice would mean for me in, in relation to empathy is kind of thinking or feeling about different ways of organizing the way we live and relate to each other and define, um, you know, the good life and success and all those kind of things. Yeah, so it, it's kind of the, the, the social, I mean, the, the justice system is kind of like a, a, a social structure. There's a whole form, uh, you know, ha patterns and uh, of how that works. And it's, it, it's not really, you know, the most conducive system towards fostering connection between people. And so it's, it's how do we kind of change the systems, social systems, so that they are conducive, so that you kind of go into the system and it just moves you towards a deeper connection with, with others, more what I call empathic connection, you know, between others. Yeah, and, and I think linked to that, I mean, you could think about the justice system or use kind of legal metaphors or actually think about existing legal frameworks. And I think, I mean, for me, one of the biggest questions about, uh, you know, democracy, social justice, kind of autonomy, freedom, all these things is, is thinking about neoliberalism and how in, well, at least kind of, you know, in a UK, North American context and many other kind of Western European countries and and actually all over the world but in, in in slightly different ways you've got this growing almost consensus that we organize our society primarily by way of the market so if something's good for the market it's good for society and if it's not good for the market or if it fails to kind of be successful in market terms or by market logic then it is deemed to have failed entirely and it, this is the context in which for example you could have a community health program that is implemented in a given, um, you know, space, city, town, whatever, manages to uh, reduce kind of waiting times for appointments, manages to help people and do, you know, great things in all manner of ways, but because it hasn't made a profit or because it's, it's made a slight loss, it's deemed to be a complete failure and needs to be, um, you know, uh, made extinct because it hasn't been successful in terms of the laws of the market. And um, I think that, that relates back to kind of what you were talking about, about this constant competitive way of interacting that we are compelled to engage in because that's how our societies run. And I think, I think I'm interested in empathy in part as a way to think about how do we imagine a society that doesn't work that way? How do we imagine kind of being able to relate to each other politically, socially, affectively in different ways that aren't just about kind of competition and individualism and so forth? Yeah, um, yeah it's like the, my, my sense is that the competition tends to uh, alienate us from each other because we're looking at, uh, we're, you know, it's like whoever wins is the one that's gonna get the goodies or, and all the emotional, you know, charge. And, and uh, so, you know, we're kind of like hedging, we're closing off uh, some of our emotions, not sharing, you know, holding the cards, you know, close to the vest, because I'm not going to share with you with what I've 
God, because, you know, I got to compete with you. So um, that whole relationship of empathy and a competition is something I've been really thinking about recently because there's a couple of competitions going on. There's one, Ashoka, I don't know if you know them, they're a social entrepreneur organization. Um, and they create a competition for the best idea, ideas for empathy in kind of the school system. So it's using competition and they had like 600 applicants, right? So it's creating all this energy, but, uh, and there's another competition by a foundation here in California called 1440. And I actually applied for this competition uh, for, our, for our interviews and for the uh, panel discussions. And so they have like 120, uh, you know, people that sub programs were submitted there and it's a competition for like $75,000, three, you know, prizes. And I know a lot of the people, you know, in the competition. I've interviewed them. I've been on panels with them. And you, you, you're going into this competition. It's like, oh, I got, I got to kind of close off a little bit, right? Because we're in competition now. And, and uh, so that competition really uh, creates some distance. And, and um, so I'm really wondering about that. It, it's really that whole notion of competition and how it affects, you know, because if, we're, if we have a competition, and this is a quote I wanted to mention, I don't know if you've seen it from Gloria Steinem. You know, she is, is a feminist. She's been through the whole movement. And then I saw a, a talk she gave recently and she's, she was basically saying, well, not basically, she said, Empathy is the most revolutionary emotion. So she's kind of on the you know empathy bandwagon, and she's saying also the means are the end, or the ends are the means. And if we want a culture, you know, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, making this up, but it's, if we want a culture of empathy, we have to use empathy to kind of get there. So if we create, you know, competitions to create a culture of empathy, all we've done is created a culture of competition because that's the state yeah. we're in. So it's a little bit, you know, so I'm a little like, you know, I don't know. It's like, how do you kind of deal with those uh, kind of um, dichotomies or, you know, how do you merge those two together? Yeah, that, that, that's a really um, interesting example and, and, and set of questions. I mean, probably there's 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 good and bad things about competition in different contexts, but but that example really kind of brings to light the 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 kind of ideas. If if empathy is in part about kind of making people more attuned to one another and kind of bringing people together in different ways, then pitting them against each other is, 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 is an interesting way to, to kind of generate interest in that kind of concept. Um, I wonder what other kind of things bodies or associations or charities or whoever could do to raise interest in empathy that aren't competition based. Yeah. Um, mm, yeah. yeah. How do you, how do you maximize the empathy? It's like, um, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Simon Baron Cohen. I mean, he's there in the UK, uh, I think, and uh, he he's written the book uh, the um, Science of Evil. I think it is. There's two titles: or the American title and the English British. Zero title. degrees of empathy is one. Zero degrees of empathy. Yeah. I think title the well, the one I have. <laughs> yeah, that's the UK version. In, in the United States, they put in evil, you know, to, <laughs> for the marketing. I think. So, um, and he talks about, you know, empathy is more like a level, you know, it's like a dimmer switch, you know, I mean, we're, it seems like we all have, you know, there's this empathy going on, but it's like, how do we raise the level, the light level of the, em of, of the empathy and, you know, are competitions going to be the, the best way of doing it? And I kind of think like these discussions, you know, dialogues and panel discussions are maybe a more yeah. empathic way of going forward with it definitely and I think actually um, I haven't done this but I'd like to think about the relationship between empathy and, uh, and other kind of effective relations and um, new media and social media so if, if part of kind of what can make empathy difficult in some situations is distance whether geographic distance or other kinds of, of, of distance 
it's interesting to think about the internet, Skype, you know, new media as a way to bridge distances and to kind of facilitate different kinds of dialogues and encounters that wouldn't have been possible, you know, even 10 years ago. Um, and I'm wondering, yeah, about that. I mean, then, of course, at the same time, you have to think about the ways in which, um, well, social media, if you're thinking about Facebook or, or Twitter, are, are kind of a big part of a big um, multi-million pound corporations. You know, you can think about Facebook and, and whatever. So you're never getting outside kind of competition wholly. But, um, yeah, I think that's something that I'm interested in, in thinking about in relation to empathy. Well, an interest. I love this kind of relating empathy to all these different uh, values. That's one of my, um, like I said, goals is to I create a web page already for it. I'll send you the link. But to really kind of systematically go down the list of all these different values and have discussions about the relationship of how empathy relates. But the other question would be is how does empathy relate to questioning itself? So, I mean, we're kind of using a, a questioning paradigm, right? And sometimes questioning in itself can be um, uh, not empathic, right? There's a, you can go, there's a whole list through the like organizations, processes like from Carl Rogers and um, Marshall Rosenberg, nonviolent communication. They put together lists of things that kind of block empathy. And sometimes like asking a question is actually a way of kind of uh, blocking empathy. So mm -hmm. it's like, so kind of like, how do we use an empathic method to uh, kind of explore empathy itself? And so, I mean, those are all kind of other questions to, I mean, it's like empathy related to questioning, empathy related to justice and, um, yeah, that's that. The point about what con what might constitute an empathetic method in and of itself mm. is interesting. I mean, being a, a lecturer, an academic, or whatever, I think questioning probably is the main way that I have been trained, or kind of that you're encouraged to to um, explore something or whatever, and and therefore it's very probably difficult to not fall into that pattern, and 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 I guess. The concern or the anxiety is that if you're not questioning that you're not being critical, that you're just going along with something or you're just accepting or you're only skimming the surface and you're not kind of unpacking further. But but maybe that itself kind of, you know, maybe then you, you're still insisting on one way of of creating knowledge. So I, yeah, no, that's an interesting point that I'll, I will think about more. <laughs> yeah, I've seen some uh, science uh, programs where the students are actually imagining and acting out being like atoms or cells or so it's like you actually use the imaginative um you know process to put yourself into it to act it out to see what it would be like to be in that situation maybe einstein's you know thought experiments had a little bit of that like if i was a beam of light you know what would i be experiencing how would i see the world um, from that perspective, so so that's uh, so about, yeah, that's kind of another kind of a connection there too. That's something I'd like to kind of explore as well. And it also provides a very early, you know, example of people thinking perhaps about empathy outside of relationships between two human subjects. What does it mean to empathize with an atom? Um, you know, what does it mean to empathize? I've seen some writing on um, empathizing with a building, trying to think about what it would feel like to be the column of a, you know, a Corinthian column on a, on a, on a building. And, um, you know, th those raise kind of very interesting questions about how we think about emotions for so long, and, and, or at least in common sense, we think about emotions as something that well, sometimes only humans have, and maybe some animals, and those are, are, you know, confined within the boundaries of our minds or souls and bodies. But, you know, we could actually think about it in drastically different ways, potentially. Yeah, so a lot, lot to uh, explore here. This is, uh, we've gone for about an hour. We could, I think we could go on for hours here. But, uh, yeah, so maybe we can have some further discussions. Um, you know, I'm doing these panel discussions, and... If you're interested in exploring any of those 
relationships, you know, you know, empathy and fear or shame or, you know, any, any of those, maybe we can continue a dialogue that's more specific to each of each of those because it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> okay. Well then, um, thank you so much for, you know, spending the time on and sharing your, your experiences and thoughts and feelings on, on this uh, topic. We had a lot of fun with it and look forward to kind of continuing the dialogue. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And then kind of, it's been really um, great to kind of find out about um, you and your project and kind of the website. And so I'm, I'm certainly going to be able to use that as a really, really uh, rich resource for kind of the work that I'm doing. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Then I'll say goodbye then and wish you okay. a good day there. Good evening, I think. Uh, yep. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. See you later. Bye, Carolyn. <laughs> Bye. Bye. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.